this week on To the Contrary. First, many Democratic voters are asking, what gives with Arizona Democratic Senator Kirsten Sinema's hold out on eliminating the filibuster? She says it's protected women's rights in prior Congresses. Then, a controversial anti-poverty experiment, guaranteed income. Will it free single mothers from poverty, or is it a giveaway? Hello, I'm Bonnie Urbe. Welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, voting rights and women's rights. Democrats have lost their battle over voting rights and the filibuster. So now they're moving forward, focusing on issues they believe they can win. All the Republicans and two Democrats blocked both bills. Joe Manchin of West Virginia, and Kirsten Sinema of Arizona. Liberal activists have put pressure on them. Emily's List, the largest funder of pro-choice female Democrats, is taking an extraordinary measure. It says it will pull Sinema's funding for re-election. Emily's List was Sinema's largest donor in her 2018 run for the Senate. For her part, Sinema says, She's always been a fan of the filibuster because, in her words, it compels moderation. And she says it's been used in prior Congresses to protect against attacks on women's health, clean air and water, and aid to children and families in need. Joining me today are former Maryland U.S. Representative Donna Edwards, Chair of the Center for Equal Opportunity, Linda Chavez, co-founder of Repro Action, Aaron Matson, and Washington Examiner commentary writer, Tiana Lowe. Donna Edwards, why should the ordinary citizen care about the filibuster? I'm, it's, a, it's a word that I think puts people to sleep. So how do we tell them why it's so important? Well, I, I think the important thing to know is the filibuster is not law. It's not written into the Constitution. It is a way um, that it supposedly has protected minority rights. But if you actually look at the history of the filibuster, particularly with regard to voting rights, um, the filibuster has been used to stand in the way of voting rights and civil rights um, for African Americans and other uh, disadvantaged communities. And so I think that those who are looking to protect the filibuster really misunderstand the history and um, that it doesn't really have any constitutional underpinnings. And in this case, um, it's been used to do exactly the wrong thing. I'm not a huge fan of the filibuster. Uh, and Donna is actually uh, absolutely right. Uh, this is a Senate rule. It's a rule that the Senate itself uh, can change and it doesn't require a change in law or anything like that. However, I will say that I think you have to be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. If in fact you got rid of the filibuster and Mitch McConnell after the next election ended up being the majority leader and you know Kev, uh, Kevin uh, McCarthy ended up being ahead of the House and the House and bills came over from the House uh, that Democrats wanted to stop without the filibuster, it would be much more difficult to stop them. So while I agree, you know, when we say it's there to protect minority rights, it's not there to protect minority rights when you think of it in terms of race or ethnicity, it's minority rights in terms of partisanship. And it has uh, been used against civil rights bills in the past, but we were able to pass the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and the 1968 Housing Act, despite the filibuster. All right, but let's just explain to people, it's, it's a technical uh, tool developed by the Senate to allow the party out of power to have more power to block legislation that they believe is harmful. Um, Tiana, how does this relate to voting rights and what is going on at the state level across the country with voting rights? So I am very confused about this myth that there is voter suppression on a mass scale 
when you have states like Georgia passing voter bills designed to regulate elections across the state, I mean, the state of Georgia, the, the Republican passed bill offers more days of early voting than are offered in Joe Biden's home state of Delaware. The, con the Constitution grants Congress a limited amount of power to regulate or oversee congressional elections, but the Constitution does not vest Congress with the authority to federalize presidential elections. The real concern that I think everyone understands was January 6th. How do you prevent another January 6th from happening? One, put up two candidates who aren't senile septuagenarians, and two, reform the Electoral Count Act. That is something that Mitch McConnell and other top Republicans have been very open to doing. It would make it so that way you can't be this cosplaying as, as trying to reject uh, the votes of the electors and not certifying what the electoral college votes are. Why do the Democrats care so much about what's going on at the state level and what they see the Republicans trying to do to the electoral process? Bonnie, there's a lot to be concerned about. As our country faces an authoritarian threat, we saw that on January 6th, one year ago, where there was an attempt to overthrow the United States government to keep Trump in power indefinitely. And now we see a number of concerning trends where we have uh, Trump loyalists running for secretary of state in a number of states. We also have Trump loyalists um, who claim that they also would work to overturn the results of a legitimate free and fair election, uh, running for governor and running for those local spots. Some of it's happening more quietly. We also see efforts like in Florida uh, recently has moved to do more gerrymandering to keep uh, to uh, deprive voters of color of uh, seats in the legislature and also really disturbing things like Governor Ron DeSantis um, now has this new sort of mercenary um, election force that where he wants to intimidate people at the polls. So there is a lot to be concerned about. All right. Now let's turn to Kirsten Cinema. Why was all the focus on her and not uh, as much on Joe Manchin? And how will she how will she be able to run and win without um, the support of Emily's list? Anybody? Part of the challenge um, that uh, we have that many people have with uh, Senator Cinema is was her timing. She went to the floor of the Senate to essentially pull the rug out from underneath. President Joe Biden, literally as his motorcade was warming up to come to the Senate um, to make an announcement on her position on the filibuster. And apart from that, her speech on the floor really uh, recasts history. The filibuster hasn't been used for uh, comedy and you know the good governance of the Senate. Um, and especially in recent years, there have been a number of times when there have been carve outs for the filibuster, even Senator Sinema had voted for one of those carve outs with the debt ceiling just a few weeks before. And so I think that she will not be able to get without the support of Emily's list. It's not really clear to me um, you know, whether she'll be able to mount a successful run for reelection. I think that she is likely to face a primary challenge given what has happened now. And the fact is that the reason that we need uh, changes to, uh, to voting rights is because we shouldn't have states undermining federal elections at the expense of voters. I, I would just say in terms of cinema getting uh, attention, she's got attention the last couple of weeks, but most of the attention was focused on Joe Manchin earlier early. on. Yeah, earlier. But yeah. And, and it, 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 part of it is that she stayed quiet. We, we knew that she did not want to support change in the rules to, to get rid of the filibuster for the voting rights bill, uh, but she hadn't been very outspoken. And so when she did dis, uh, decide to speak and that essentially sealed the fate, uh, even though Manchin's vote enough uh, would have been enough. Uh, I, I think there was uh, antagonism towards her. But in terms of uh, her being able to win re-election, I mean, that's an open question. Um, who knows? Uh, Arizona has, you know, swung very far to the right uh, within the Republican Party, but the state itself has become more purple. So uh, Emily's List uh, supported her because she is pro-choice. They like that. Uh, but whether she will be able to 
retain that support. Uh, you know, I, I doubt it. Obviously, Emily's List isn't going to give her money, but that doesn't mean that she won't uh, win re-election. She certainly is chasing Republican voters, but I do think it goes back to the fact that Emily's List was the largest single contributor to her in 2018, and she didn't just lose the support of Emily's List. She also lost the support of NARAL Pro-Choice America, and I, I just want to lift that up because it's a really big deal that organizations that have historically been more conservative about reproductive rights are finally starting to heed the call of reproductive justice advocates and saying, you know what, voting rights and reproductive rights are inextricably linked and you cannot have one without the other. And I want to go back to something Senator Sinema said, and she made a claim that the filibuster has been used to protect reproductive rights. Well, let's also talk about the fact that Already when Mitch McConnell was Senate Majority Leader, he did away with the rules and went with simple majority rules for ramming through Supreme Court nominees. And we are just Kavanaugh because of not having or just going for a simple majority vote. It was Harry yeah. Reid who nuked who nuked the judicial filibuster. It was not Mitch McConnell. No, not, Mitch McConnell not said with regard to Supreme Court nominees. The rules were completely upended and different for Supreme Court. Uh, nominees. And I think for the highest court in the land, I think it's important for us to understand how Mitch McConnell functioned both in terms of bringing up a nomination for Amy Coney Barrett in an election year when he had blocked it for Merrick Garland. Tiana, let me just interject here. Not just Kavanaugh, we're also, t uh, t I mean, not just Amy Coney Barrett, we're talking about Neil Gorsuch. That was the the seat that Obama tried to give to Merrick Garland, a very middle of the road guy, not a flaming liberal by any means, um, but he, but they, uh, McConnell played games by saying at one point, uh, you can't, you can't uh, bring up a nomination too close to an election. And then of course, doing it in the case of Amy Coney Barrett. But Bonnie, quickly, just, you know, uh, that's the problem that I pointed to. You have to be careful what you do because you change the rule. Harry Reid did for lower court appointees. And then the Republicans come along and they change it for Supreme Court. So the idea of the filibuster, as I say, I'm not going to defend the filibuster because it's been used for very nefarious purposes at some points in our history. But the point of it is to try to have on certain issues more consensus. And uh, when you get rid of that, then you end up with, you know, the kinds of decisions on both sides that you may not like. All right. But so you think keeping the filibuster would or would not lead to more unity in the country? Well, I think that it can end up leading to more unity. I mean, I think that having, you know, just passing major sweeping legislation, one of the problems I had with the Health Care Act was passing it on a totally partisan basis uh, is not best for consensus in the country. I'd like to see more consensus building. You know, at this point in history, that's really hard because we are so deeply divided. Just a month or so ago, the rule was changed to accommodate the debt limit. And so if that rule could be changed, a temporary accommodation, there's no reason that there could not have been an accommodation for a constitutional right, uh, for the right to vote. And so um, the, the Senate has been careful over the years of making these various changes to the filibuster rule when it suits their purposes. They just I didn't mean, do it in this instance. As, as far as consensus building goes, I hope people realize you know, Harry Reid gifted us the ability to add three justices to the Supreme Court. When those justices uphold the 15-week abortion ban in Dobbs, 2024 GOP will run if the legislative filibuster is nuked. They will run on making a federal 15-week abortion ban. So that's what it does. And I don't know if that's the best thing for the country. I'm pro-life, but I don't think that that's necessarily a great precedent to set to make it so you have the tyranny of a very thin majority. But that is what will happen. Well, tyranny of an actual minority. I read somewhere that there are 22, 22 million more Democratic voters in the country than registered Democrats than Republicans. For something as important as voting rights and making sure that people, I mean, what's wrong with offering people a bottle of water at the polling places? That's not going to buy a vote. What's wrong with including um, more um, uh, drop boxes so that people uh, can drop their, their ballots in the mail? What's wrong with making election day 
a holiday. I mean, these are things that are really common sense kinds of reforms. They're supported by a majority of the American people. And two senators should not have been able to stop that. From partisan politics to anti-poverty programs. Organizations and individuals committed to lifting people out of poverty are promoting and even financially supporting pilot programs that offer a guaranteed income. It's a movement that continues to spread across the country. Right now, there are more than 35 such programs in at least 17 states. The unconditional stipends range from $500 to $1,000 per month. The money comes with no strings attached. Families have full discretion about how to spend the money. The Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration reports people who received the money found full-time employment at twice the rate of those who did not. Participants also suffered fewer health problems, including depression and anxiety. In 2020, the Pew Research Center found 54% of adults oppose the federal government providing guaranteed basic income. But many of these programs get funding from private donors. So Linda Chavez, let's start with the private money because it's it's really two different stories. In a sense, you know, taxpayers don't have a right to weigh in on what private foundations and private donors do with their money, but they sure as heck do on government money. So explain to me. That's exactly right. And And I think uh, individuals who have money should be able to spend it as they choose. That's where I will disagree with some of my Democratic friends on the panel uh, in terms of elections and spending money uh, to support candidates or run ads or whatever. But yes, if a private organization, a private foundation wants to to give money, there have been several experiments in major cities across the country to uh, create this basic income. The question is about public money, though, and whether or not we should have a law that provides public support. And there, I think, you know, I'm with the 54 percent of Americans who have qualms about this. And my qualms have to do with whether or not this does, in fact, over time, depress work initiative. We have a huge labor shortage in this country right now. Um, You know, we have very low unemployment and we have a lot of jobs that are going unfilled. And If you give incentives for people not to work, uh, that's gonna add to that. However, you could have targeted kinds of support. You could have targeted support as we did with the child tax uh, credit, uh, which I think did lift a lot of children out of poverty, uh, which is something I would support. But having just a blanket uh, amount that goes to to, uh, families uh, from the government, uh, I think is not the way we wanna go. And by the way, this isn't a new idea. This was Richard Nixon's idea back in the 1970s. It didn't go anywhere then either. Tiana, what do you think? Will it motivate? Um, because it's mainly going to, let's face it, young single mothers. Um, will it? Is it enough to motivate them to be able to handle raising their kids and working at the same time? I do think you know that something like what Andrew Yang proposed during his 2020 presidential campaign, replacing our need-based welfare system, one that disincentivizes work with a need-blind, flat, basic income tethered to inflation. I actually think that's something that would be very much inter- worth entertaining. It's just it's just difficult because there's no way we're overhauling our current labyrinth of our welfare system. Do you have any idea what it would cost to do something so, I mean, like it depends. That? It depends on the program. The one really workable program that I've seen that actually could be passed through reconciliation is what Mitt Romney has proposed. The Family Security Act would end the SALT deduction, so remove, so cap the SALT deduction to, from $10,000 to zero, and tie together a few uh, aspects of welfare spending, and instead issue a basic income to parents based on the amount of children they have and the age of those children. Unlike our current welfare system, it would incentivize marriage by not having the marriage penalty of some tax credits. And it would also specifically be going towards, you know, family building and combating child poverty. And when you tether these programs to if you are working or if you're not working, then it doesn't account for realistic things like, oh, do you want to have a household where both parents work and the money is spent on home care? Or do you want to use that money to subsidize 
a mother who wants to stay at home with their kids and be a full-time home worker. And that way they can only work on one income. I agree with Linda and the fact that private donors can do whatever they want. But the problem is you need to start with something that's workable. Romney's bill is very workable. I don't think a national UBI for everyone, including childless adults, is feasible right now. And when we look at the private donor funded experiments that are happening in the cities and and some of the the results that are coming out of them, it actually doesn't disincentivize work in order to give people direct cash aid. I mean, first of all, I just want to say wholeheartedly that direct cash aid is affirming. It gives people dignity to pursue uh, what they need when they're struggling for money. And what we found is that As you noted at the outset, I mean, the fact is that people actually are more likely um, after having this direct cash aid coming to them um, to be in stable employment with it. I go back to my own history. I raised my son mostly on my own, and I can think back to those days when having that extra income wouldn't have been a disincentive to working, but it would have made sure that I wasn't you know, scoping out food pantries every week and struggling to pay, you know, the electricity and uh, childcare and those sort of things. So I do think that this is an idea that has come. I come out of philanthropy as well. And so I understand the value of experimenting in philanthropy with some of these ideas to prove things like people actually are incentivized to work when they don't have to struggle to meet, you know, basic expenses Uh, of a household. Um, The way that we've structured it, particularly through COVID relief, um, the child tax credit and additional assistance for uh, families with children is a concept that's actually rooted in the idea of a basic, uh, basic income. And so I think that these are really ideas that are worth exploring. And the reality is that most mothers, uh, most families, If they're given money, they put it right back into their families and their communities. They don't abuse it. Uh, They spend it in responsible ways to take care of themselves and their families. The United Nations has acknowledged that all over the world, and that's true in the United States, too. Let's tell the audience you were married when you had your son and you came from a family who really pushed you towards getting educated and getting ready for a professional career. So, um, and while I don't think anybody is going to get rich off of 500 to $1,000 per month, uh, I mean, in fact, in this inflationary environment, it wouldn't even probably cover groceries and, and diapers for two people for a month. But um, should, should not the government be incentivizing if that's getting educated and getting married before you have your child? And so that you have a chance at earning real income for yourself after the child is born. You know, if you think about people's lives, when you take something off the plate, like having to struggle for all of these things or, you know, working two or three jobs, guess what women do? They go to school, they go to community college, they get educated, they build their skills. And so, um, you know, I don't think that we should think of this as a zero sum game that if you, um, you know, give uh, families and mothers Uh, those resources that they are also going to focus on their children's education, be more participatory in schools, all of the things that actually lead to more successful outcomes uh, for for women and for families and for for their children. Uh, Did, in fact, help uh, Bill Clinton pass welfare reform. And I think the idea of a government check, it depends on how much it is, uh, whether there are strings attached, but anything that we do has got to be tied to not disincentivizing work. Again, it would be very different if we had full employment and and very high labor force participation, but we don't. Labor force participation is going down, going down dramatically in the United States. And some of it is age, an aging population, but some of it is people just dropping out. Are you gonna deprecate the um, value of getting a job when you're giving somebody $1,000 a month? Is that even possible? I mean, of course. It depends on what other. It depends on what other programs are available and what other assistance is being provided. Well, You've got to make it not more um, financially beneficial not to work than to work, unless, of course, you want to do what Tiana is suggesting, and that is incentivize at least one parent, probably the the mother, to stay home in two parent families. Uh, you know, that's a debate that we can have. 
um, it, it is a debate that's worth having. Look, I don't want to leave this conversation without saying that it feels rather elitist for us to be having a conversation saying that people don't want to work, that um, you know, families do need support, and we underestimate how the that one the value of work and the fact that women, especially women who are raising their children, give them a little bit of support. They want to work. They want to get their education. They want to take care of their families. That's the majority. I don't like talking about a minority who might abuse a system. All right. And, Donna, and again, I want to say, I want to state for the record that a thousand dollars a month is not going to disincentivize anybody from working. That's just a little. It's a it's a teeny tiny drop in the barrel that they need to support their children, get educated, and and get going uh, on a on a good basis for their careers. That's it for this edition. Let's keep the conversation going on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next time. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more. PBS.